today. We're going to pray for you a little bit later in the service today. We've been talking about head right, heart right. And these are two of the most important things you can do is always check your head and check your thinking. That's what we've talked about over these last three weeks. Today's number four. And we've been talking about mostly thinking. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about developing the heart of an overcomer. So you have to develop a heart of an overcomer. It's different than just saying, I'm an overcomer. But when you've got a heart that is an overcomer, that's what we're going to talk about today. The book of Revelation says that an overcomer in the Greek is niakau. It's the Greek word. What it means is to conquer, to prevail, triumph, and overcome. Overcome. You have to have a heart of an overcomer because God calls you an overcomer. A lot of times we get passive, but I want you to know something. Hey, everybody, you're in a battle. You are in a battle. As a Christian, we might not like to hear that, but there is no Christian that can opt out of a battle. If you are a believer, you are in a battle. Somebody's got to tell you, but probably not. You probably know that already. You are in a battle. And you have to have a heart of a warrior, the heart of an overcomer. And some people that receive Christ and they start growing in their faith, they... Um, they kind of resist that once in a while. Like, I don't want to be a warrior. I don't want to be a fighter. Well, it's too late. You are in a battle. Welcome to the battle. We're going to learn how to battle. And our battle is not against, uh, not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. Although the enemy uses people, we're not in a battle against people. The battle we are in is against the principalities and powers of darkness in the world that is after you. You do have an enemy, and you are called by God an overcomer. You are an overcomer. So the battle takes place mostly right up here in your mind. The enemy is constantly trying to defeat you. The enemy is trying to pull you into sin, create habits, addictions, struggles. Some of those come from iniquities that get passed down to you from maybe grandparents or sins that you're Grandmas and grandpas have participated in. The Bible calls those iniquities or generational curses. And all of us have dealt with those type of things. But I'm here to tell you today, you are an overcomer. You're not held captive. The enemy ultimately wants to get you to give up. The enemy wants you to quit, throw in the towel. Here's what the enemy really wants. The en 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 enemy wants you to go in cruise control. In other words, live your life with the path of least resistance. Like, let me just get by. I don't like all this. Let me just make it through another day. And I know there's moments where you have to survive, but what the Lord is looking for, and I believe in this church that we are called by God to be overcomers, to be conquerors, to be occupiers of the land, to be aggressive, to be on attack, to be on the offensive, not always on the defensive, not always pulling back and going, God, rescue me. God, rescue me. He says, I put the power in you. I've put the word in you. I've put the praise on the inside of you. Go occupy. Go pray. Go declare the word of God. Go proclaim. Go drive the flag, the stake in the ground and say, this is for me and my family. We are going to serve the Lord. We are going to occupy in Jesus' name. That's who you are. You are an overcomer. So the first thing that you and I have to do is we have to make our mind up. This is where the thinking comes in. You have to make a declaration. When I say drive a flag in the ground, you need to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we're not passively serving the Lord. We're not casually serving the Lord. We're obsessively serving the Lord. If you're here for the first time today, welcome to Enjoy Church. We are so thankful you're here. I'm Pastor Darren, and uh, we've got great things in store for you. I promise you, come back again. You'll like it. 
you'll you'll like what God has for you here at the church. We've got a great group of people here, friendly people, loving people, accepting people. And so we're glad you're here. The first thing you have to do is you have to decide. You really, you really do. You really have to make your mind up and you have to say, I will overcome. You draw a line in the sand in your life, so to speak. You draw a line in the sand and you say, you know what? I make my stake. I make my claim. The devil's not having me and the devil's not having my children. The devil's not having my church. The devil's not going to have my territory. I am going to proclaim in the name of Jesus. We are overcomers. I'm agreeing with God says, the book of Revelation says there is a crown that is given to the overcomer. And you, I declare over you, you're going to wear that crown. You are overcomers and you're going to walk through eternity someday and they'll look at you and go, overcomer, 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 overcomer. Not everybody's going to be an overcomer because they don't choose it. They don't choose it. I'm encouraging you today to choose. I am an overcomer. Declare it, live in it, believe it, walk in it, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Revelation 3, chapter 3, verse 21. He who overcomes is victorious. I will grant him to sit beside me on my throne as I myself overcame it and was victorious and sat beside my father. So make your mind up. You are an overcomer. Play to win, not play to exist. When I say play, I mean live. Live to win. Live life as an occupier. Live life as a conqueror. Do you mind if I get passionate about this? When I talk about heart, when I talk about heart, I'm talking about passion. I'm talking about drive from the inside. When I talk about the passion of your soul and you being an overcomer, a conqueror, I'm talking about the passion of God that lives on the inside that says, I am an attacker. I'm an offense. I'm not just, oh, Jesus, rescue me. There are moments where you need rescued by Jesus, but Jesus has also said, I've given you the power I live on the inside of you, and I have great things for you. Occupy it. Walk it out. Live it out. Most people give themselves a reason to put things off. Did you know that? Most people, I've noticed it in the church world, it's so easy to do, to have a reason to procrastinate, to have a reason to put something off for a little while. It's so easy to do that. But what God wants is he wants a people who won't put things off, but they declare today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of action. I'm going to act and move out. You know why most people put things off? They have a fear, a fear of failure and a fear of rejection. And those two things will hold you back from overcoming the fear of failure. Think about failure, what failure really is. Failure is only a learning process. The most successful, the most conquering people in the world are the people who failed the most. Failure teaches you many times what not to do. And you cannot, as a believer, be afraid of failing. We always say this in our leadership team meetings, in our staff meetings, and I teach it to you. Don't be afraid to try stuff. You know, most of us haven't heard the audible voice of God, but we hear the small whisper of God. I think God does that intentionally to get us to really tune in and listen and seek him. Think about how cool it would be if God just gave us that big audible voice all the time and he was saying, my son, Darren, come here. I would love that. But that doesn't require anything. What requires something is to seek God, to pray, to ask the Holy Spirit, to pray in the Spirit. 
using my prayer language. I pray in the spirit. He gives revelation, understanding. He leads me as I pray. And what I've discovered about it is that by seeking God, I get confirmation. But what it does require is it requires me to lean in and to listen. And most people forget this and then act. And you cannot be afraid of failing. Sometimes failure is the advancement. Think about a child. We have a brand new grandbaby. We have a two-year-old grandbaby. And Alora is, she turned two in September. She's walking around. She used the potty for the first time by herself this week. And I'm thinking about, thinking about this. What about all the failures called diapers? What if we just said, look, look at this child. She's a failure. She can't even poop. What about walking? I loved it when we saw her walk. What if she said, you know, Papa, I'm afraid to walk because I'm afraid I'm not very good at it. I'll probably fail. And my advice would be, yes, you will fail many times. But here's what you'll do. You'll get back up. Church, our walk with Christ is the same way. We fall many times. And true failure is not true failure until you never get back up. But when you will continue to trust God, and when you've made a mistake, and even if you made a mistake attempting to hear the Lord and you think, well, I must have missed God on that. Did you know that in your attempt to pursue God, in your attempt to hear the voice of God, in your attempt to claim what God has for you, did you know that God will take even the mistakes and the failures and he will build something incredible in your life? And God, you, many of you, you've been through divorce or you've been through a, a financial situation. Maybe you spent too much, you got in debt, but you learn from it and you're better as a result, don't be afraid of failure. And then many people, they won't do what God is calling them to do because they're afraid of rejection. They're afraid they might not please people. Listen, one of the worst fears, probably the biggest fear in life, is looking for, longing for, and needing with the neediness the approval of other people. When you long for an inordinate longing for people to pat you on the back and love on you and please people. You miss God's best. I mean, we all love that. We all like that when we have the approval of others. But don't live your life with that as a goal. You will need to come to the place in your life as an overcomer and a heart of an overcomer. You'll have to come to a place where you realize not everybody's going to like you. And that's okay. That's okay. You don't have to please everybody and you don't have to have the approval. You need to please God and in you being who God created you to be and in pleasing God, guess what? You'll please some people, but not everybody. Even Jesus didn't have everybody on his side. So I encourage you draw that line in the sand and you declare that you hope in the Lord and that your strength comes from the Lord. Think about Job, this verse in Job. I think about this. I've meditated on this verse quite a bit. Job chapter 13, verse 15 says this, though he slay me, you need to declare, I don't care how bad the opposition is. See, Job had lost his children he had lost his animals. He had lost his produce. And his family and those that were closest to him were saying, you need to quit. You're not gifted for this anymore. You're not talented for this anymore. The Lord has put a curse on you. He's pulled his protection from you. And I love Job's overcoming attitude. He didn't understand stuff. He was messed up in his theology. But here's what I do love about Job. Job made this declaration that though he slay me, yet I will serve him. I will trust him. I will declare victory. And you need to have that kind of grit in your passion. See, when I talk about heart and I talk about overcoming, 
I'm not talking about a theoretical name that the Bible gave you. You're an overcomer and it's cute. No, I'm talking about grit from the soul that says, you know what? I don't know. I don't know why I'm going through all this stuff. But you be like Job and you say, though I go through everything and the world breaks me down, I will get back up and someday I'll be in heaven with him and I'm trusting the Lord. I will not quit. I will follow him all the days of my life. Amen. Cultivate, cultivate, cultivate. That's what you're doing here at church today. You're cultivating the heart of an overcomer. Cultivate it. Cultivate it. Overcomers refuse to waste their time and energy on obstacles and excuses. Overcomers won't waste their mental energy on excuses. Most people in the world, they use excuses as a reason. Zig Ziglar, I love the famous Zig Ziglar, he's not with us anymore, he's in heaven. But one of the things I loved about Zig is Zig would always talk about the loser's limp. Have you ever heard of the loser's limp? What the loser's limp is, is if you're in a race, have you ever seen this happen before? I knew some guys like this in high school. You're in a race and you all take off and you're running as fast as you can. And at the point that you see that... Um, that, that, that you see that you're not going to be first, that somebody is surpassing you, you start getting a little limp. Like, oh, I would have been in first place. It's kind of like I would have played, played professional ball, except for, you know, I twisted my knee and never really healed quite right. But you know I would have played professional baseball. Yes, I, I, I would have. And the loser's limp always looks for excuses of why things didn't work out so great. See, overcomers, they don't look to their excuses and they don't embrace the excuses. Here's what winners do, what champions do. They put their energy into action. Did you hear that? Action. Philippians 4, we've quoted this verse in the last three weeks, and I want to quote it again today. Finally, brothers and sisters, keep your thoughts on whatever is right or whatever is deserved praise. Things that are true, honorable, fair, pure, acceptable, commendable. And here's the key word, the next word right here. Everybody take your finger and circle it. It's the word practice. Practice means that when the service is over today, I got some good information, but it wasn't just a cute service. It wasn't just a good service. I got the literal word of God in my passion or in my heart, and I'm going to practice, put it into practice. I'm going to declare the word. I'm going to think about the word. What does it say? It says, think on things that are right, things that deserve praise, things that are commendable, pure, acceptable, Practice what you've learned and received from me and what you've heard and saw me do, and then the God who gives peace will be with you. Amen. And maybe you're in a place in your life today where you need the peace of God. Maybe you're going through some relationship stuff, maybe some financial stuff, some stuff at work, maybe with your family, your children. You're going through stuff. We all go through stuff. But what we need to do is we need to practice being overcomers. Practice meditation, practice confession. Don't allow yourself to be able to complain, whine, moan, groan, and, and, and just confess and talk about negative. Oh, I say positive things once every once in a while. No, no, no. Practice doing that. Practice living a lifestyle. When you get up in the morning, you declare. Maybe it takes you a minute to wake up. That's okay. No condemnation. Wake up. But eventually, when you wake up, go on the offensive. Stop subconsciously. Most people don't get up and go, I'm looking for some good excuses today. Have you come up with any good excuses? No, 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 don't do that. Most people don't do that. Most people subconsciously, on a subconscious level, come up with excuses of why they can't, why they won't, why they shouldn't, I'm not ready, I haven't quite been prepared, I don't have the resources, I don't have the talent, I don't have the team around me. 
That, my friend, is a bunch of junk. As the pastor of the church, it's been one of the biggest obstacles I've ever, ever in my life had to overcome. One of the things that aggravates me, you guys want to peek into my brain a little bit in my heart? One of the most aggravating, I have to hold my composure so I don't lose it, is if I ever hear a staff member or a leader over a department say, we can't do that. I don't ever want to hear that. You can't do it. You mean you won't do it. Do you know you come to a place in your life where when God puts a vision and drops something in your heart, do you know the big mistake is people think they have to figure out the how before they take the first step? Oh, that is, I feel like I'm addressing spiritual demons, not in you guys, but, but, but demons that try to put fear of failure into people. I am telling you, I have been around people that have accomplished great things in life, and I've been around people that have accomplished great things for the kingdom of God and for God. And do you know, just like God, when he called Abraham, he almost never gives you the full picture when he calls you. Why? Because it requires us to lean on him when we don't know the how. When God says to your heart, do this, and I have seen it over and over and over and over and over again. And one of the things that I look for, I'm looking for when someone is looking to come on staff or looking to be a leader, I'm looking for that mentality of a champion, of an overcomer, someone that doesn't look for excuses. But I'm believing God that we are going to do it. How are you going to do it? I don't know that part yet. I just know this. I'm going to take the next step. And as we, as you, as us, as we take the next step, as we do it, God provides. God provides. I can look back over the history of our church. And though you walk in wisdom and you don't do stupid stuff, but sometimes what God has called you to do to other people looks like stupid stuff. They think you have lost your mind because you don't have the money to do it. You don't have the resources. You may not even have the time to do it. You may not even have the talent to do it. But if God dropped that dream and that vision, and if God called you to do it, then your responsibility, my responsibility, is to say what he says and declare what he declares and to take the next step. You don't have to get to the end right now. You just have to take the next step. Hey, overcomer, you just need to take the next step. Just take the next step with God. And, and I'm, I remember looking back over the history of this church and where we came from and what God has called us to do. And I remember the resistance from people who supposedly loved me. As I shared vision, I had people say, well, you you can't. Tell me why I can't. And here's the answer, what people always say. It's not the right time. You don't have the money. You don't have the equipment. You don't have the people. You don't have the resources. It's one of the, and I'm not correcting our staff because they haven't done this to me, but I'll say it publicly, it's one of the most aggravating things I have ever heard in my life. I don't know if we can work together when you talk that negative stuff to me. If God said to do it, it don't matter if there's not money. It doesn't matter if there's not time. It doesn't matter if there's not people. If God said to do it, we have to obey the Lord. That's what we're going to do is we're going to obey the Lord. And so that has happened through the years. Through the years, we had a vision to come to O'Fallon. It didn't happen overnight. We didn't just decide one night we ate pizza. The next morning, the, the vision for a campus in O'Fallon. See, those type of visions are the ones that you don't have the grit to stay with. 
But when God starts working you working on you in something years ago, I, I know exactly when it was. It was in the late 80s, 89, 1989, was when God began to drop O'Fallon, the O'Fallon area in my heart. When did our church actually start here? It actually started here in 2007. Not on this property, but in 2007, we began to pray for this property. My wife and I would drive up and we'd walk around this property. We'd confess and declare. And the owner of the property began to become friends with, met with him, took him to lunch, took him to dinner. He said, no, I'm not going to sell it to you. It's not on my radar. But we, we became friends, and I secretly, behind the scenes, would pull up on this property. I felt like God had, had this was in our heart. But we began to meet at the Ramada Inn. We began to meet at the Fountains. We began to meet at Regency. We began to meet all over the whole community, wherever. We could hardly ever find four weeks in a row in the same place, so we just were everywhere, and we'd try to... We try to broadcast, hey, now next week we're meeting over here, next week we're over here, and then we'll be there for four weeks. And we did that. We met in Collinsville. I think we have 11 places that we met. And we kept declaring. And I had people say to me, God didn't speak that. There's no fruit. I said, well, I've got the fruit on the inside right now. It hasn't came out yet, but it is here, and God did speak, and we're going to do it. And we kept believing, and we kept praying. I'll never forget ever, I'm cutting this, short, this story short, but I'm trying to teach you how to overcome. I'll never forget the day I got a phone call and said, the owner of this building called and said, hey, are you still interested in this property? And if I would have quit a long time ago, I was moving forward. I was being directed by the Lord, and we actually even looked at a lot of other properties because you don't know. I mean, you think you know. You think you hear the voice of God, and you go forward with that. But at the same time, you know, you're open that God leads and guides and directs. And I'll never forget I don't know what you're believing for, but I want to encourage you, if it's from God, you need to have the grit and the heart of an overcomer. You might not know how, but you know it's going to happen in Jesus' name. Yes, Greatness comes from failing and learning. I encourage you, store up power. Store up your power. Are you with me? Find a way to take massive action. Don't do just little action. Do massive action. Think like a champion. Think like an overcomer. Champions think different. They think different. I'll tell you an example. I knew I was preparing for this message, and there's a guy, there's a guy that I know. He's a Christian guy. He's made millions and millions of dollars. He is a great leader. He is a great businessman. And he's made millions of dollars. I know him. I spent the night at his house, and he just he's just a full of wisdom. And he's an average-looking guy. You know, you'd look at him uh, somewhere, and you'd just think, well, he's just one of us. But what makes him different? Here's what made me think of him. So the other day, I was at Schnucks, and while I was in the grocery store, I saw what I thought was him. This guy looked just like him. And as I got closer, I realized it wasn't him, but boy, did he look like him. He looked identical to him. The same height, the same frames, the same color hair, the same stature, looked like the same guy. And then I noticed he had a badge. He worked there at the grocery store. And I thought, wow, they look just, they could, you, you could put these two together and tell people they're twins, and you would think those are twins. And I thought about that, and I thought, okay, what made the difference? Because on the outside, appearance-wise, everything looks the same. He's a multimillionaire. He's a leader. He owns two or three corporations. What's the difference between him 
and this guy. This guy's a good guy. This guy has a good job. He looks like a hard worker. What's the difference? I'm thinking all this as I'm preparing for this message. What's the difference? And I'll tell you what the difference is. It's thinking, mindset. It's action, what you're willing to pursue. It's passion from the heart. And it's gifts and talents from God developed. Did that guy have the potential? Well, on the outside, he looks identically the same. What's the difference? It's what went on up in the brain and the faith and the heart, the thinking of I can do this, I will do this, and the willingness to take risk, to go to school, to act out, to start something on this. Church, here's why I'm sharing this with you. I believe this about you. I believe you have so much more giftedness and talent on the inside of you that maybe you haven't seen or maybe you haven't recognized yet. But I call you a champion as God calls you a champion. I call you an overcomer as God calls you and declares you an overcomer. That's who you are. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says this, God's word is living. God's word is active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And the God's word will cut down and divide the places in the soul and the spirit, the place where joint and marrow meet. God's word judges a person's thoughts and intentions. Intentions is a heart word. Not just your thinking, but the intention of your heart. So here's what the word does. This is why I encourage you. Prayer, your prayer life and us praying produces joy because as we pray, we're giving God trust. Prayer is important. Prayer develops joy. Praise, when you praise, praise is a taking prayer to another level, and when you and I begin to praise God for what God is speaking, and we begin to praise God for what we're believing for, and we begin to praise God for what we're declaring, here's what praise does. Praise pushes and drives the enemy away. And the word of God, as you deposit what you're getting right now, you know what the word of God does for you? It produces power. The word of God is alive, it's powerful, it's active. As you renew your mind with the word, as you meditate on the word, as you declare the word, it produces power. So if you want to defeat the enemy, praise the Lord. If you want to trust God and get the peace of God, pray. Pray, 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 pray. And if you want absolute power, power over the enemy, begin to meditate the word, have a passion in your heart for the word, and as you declare it, you will be declaring, I am an overcomer. All of my needs are met according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The power shows up. And listen, let me give you a little nugget of gold right here. Did you know that nothing great in your life happens accidentally? And nothing great in your life happens unless it happens on a daily basis. Let me rewind. Nothing great happens in your life except for what happens on a daily basis. Listen, you are not going to build big physical muscles going to the gym once a month. All you're going to build is soreness for two or three days. But if you want to build strength and if you want to build big muscles, do it every day, every day. Praise God every day. Pray every day. Put the word in every day. Declare the word. Declare the word. Have a heart, an aggressive heart. Are you with me so far? Overcomers know how to attack the enemy. Now, being a pastor and being in church all my life, I've seen this, where most people resist the enemy only when they're under attack or when they recognize they're under attack. Most people go into defense mode. They go into curl up, 
roll up in a ball, spiritually speaking, and hide from the enemy. And they call out to God, which you should call out to God, but they call out to God without a, a, an overcomer's attack. You and I, this is where this is really going to get good for you right now. You and I are going to have to develop the heart of a warrior. I'm sorry you're in a battle, yes. but you are in a battle. And not one person in this room has opted out of the battle. I'm sorry, you're a warrior, you're in a battle, 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 and I could go through the whole room. Y'all are in a battle. Yes, sir. Everybody's in a battle. Yes, sir. Embrace it. Declare, I am the champion. Declare this, Satan, Satan, you are defeated, you are beat down and defeated, the Lord defeated you, and I'm only walking out what he already did, I'm relying on him, I'm leaning on him, and I declare, you'll not have my children, you'll not have my finances, you'll not have anything that belongs to me, that is from God, I possess it. It's mine. I declare it. The devil is a liar and he is defeated. And when you and I agree with what God says and we don't just agree, I agree with God. No, no, no. You need to get some, your eyes need to get wide. You need to get your fight on. I've always loved, ever since I was a kid, I've always loved MMA. I've always loved boxing. I've always loved fighting. I've always loved rough and tumble. Why? Because it's challenging. It's challenging. And I love to see the combat of, you know, the, I, I, I like hockey, but I don't like it as much as I used to. You guys are finding out some stuff about my personality, maybe, uh, because they don't have the fights that they used to. My favorite thing, come on, I see some heads going. I see others going, no, I'm in disgust. But just me, this is me. I'm not saying you have to even agree with me. But the thing I love about a good hockey game is not just one fight. I want to see a lot of fights. And my favorite entertainment is to watch it when the whole team fights. <laughs> if you don't like that, pray for me. I, I don't know. Maybe I'll get fixed. But right now, the reason I like it is not that I like to see people get beat up, but I, I like to see people that rise to a challenge. And one of my passions, because I know to overcome the lies of Satan and the lie of the devil, one of the things that you and I have to do is we have to rise up on the inside, put a smile of victory on our face, make some declarations. We're doing this. If it came from God, we're doing this. And if God said doing it, we're going to do it. If God says you're an overcomer, you're an overcomer. If God says you've got the victory, I agree with you. You've got the victory. And so we're not passive. We're not standby. We're involved. We take action. We pursue. We go after the enemy. O overcomers cannot tolerate enslavement, being held captive. Have you ever been held captive by something? I have. That's why I'm excited about those Krispy Kreme out there. But I will not eat one because I am an overcomer. Oh, the Krispy Kreme used to have a grip on me. I was enslavement. I'm not trying to hurt your sales. Just go give them some money if you're not going to eat them. But for me, I had to say no because once I start and once I give place, I go from one <laughs> to two. I won't just eat one or two chips. I'm eating the whole bag. Amen. Am I getting you excited now? Now you're engaged in the message today. All right. Listen, it requires us to declare that we are going after the enemy. If the enemy has any territory, an overcomer 
does not put up with enslavement. Maybe it's a mentality of, of lack, a fear of not enough. I would encourage you, begin to declare as an overcomer, I am an overcomer. God is my provision. I walk in it. I am a tither. I am a giver. I trust God. And I declare my actions overcome what I'm believing for. Think about in the scripture, just three of them right off the bat. David was a warrior. You know what David was a warrior over? Righteousness and justice. He hated injustice. Think about Paul, the apostle Paul. Think about his life. Did you know that Paul, though he was a Pharisee and entrenched in tradition, Paul became a warrior against tradition and religion. Remember when Peter got back into, you got to eat this way and you got to do that. And Paul's like, dude, what is wrong with your religious rear end? He told him, hey, that's not what the grace of God is about. Think about Jesus. Do you know what Jesus was a warrior against? He attacked sickness. He had Jesus attacked disease. Jesus attacked unbelief. Remember when he'd have a room and there'd be, they'd ask him to pray and he would look around the room and he did this more than one time. He did this many times. He'd say, you need to get out of the room. You need to get out of the room. You need to get out of the room. You need... Why? Because he couldn't put up with that unbelief. You need to determine what you're willing to draw a line in the sand about and declare this is what we will have. This is what we won't have. So you have to know your opponent. You have to know your opponent. Target your enemy. Don't avoid him. Go after your opponent. As Christians, believers, you are overcomers. Go after it. Think about Satan. His methods are very predictable. He's a liar. He's going to lie to you. He moves in fear. He's going to try to put fear on you. He moves through intimidation. He's going to try to get people to reject you. His biggest tool that Satan will use is that he's going to try to get you offended. Did you know that the way the enemy is most productive in most Christians' life is to get their feelings hurt or to get them offended? And when you get into a place, I'm not saying offense doesn't come, but when you embrace offense, when you embrace it, Scripture says it turns to a root of bitterness. And why it's so dangerous is because that offense that turned to bitterness becomes a polluted, polluted stream. And it will not just hurt you, it'll hurt your children, it'll hurt your spouse, it'll hurt others around you because you end up inadvertently, you didn't mean to do it, but because you get offended, it's Satan's tool. You need to make your mind up, I'm unoffendable. Oh, I know offense comes, but I'm not hanging on to that. I won't do it, I forgive, I pray for. When you have an enemy that is a flesh and blood enemy, you forgive them and you move on. You forgive them, you love them, love them at a distance. Sometimes you have to. Boundaries are healthy. Don't spend time with the wrong people. I had one of my children, uh, I could always tell when they had been with this other child and they would come home and they go, I go, hey, have you been with so-and-so? What? I, why would you say that? because of the funk that is on your attitude. Every time you are with so-and-so, your attitude gets funky. Funky butt. How many of you know who you hang around, you become like. 
And that's why offense, love, forgive, move on. Don't give ear to offense. It'll hurt you because it's hurt them. But mostly you're responsible for yourself. So know the methods of the enemy. Very predictable. Deal with it. Amen. And then your future depends on this. Reach out for the help of God. Reach out for help. Ask God, God, I need your strength. I need your help. One of the great things about the church and coming to church is the encouragement. Man, I love it. See, we had church online during COVID and it was okay. We worked hard. Thank God for our team. These guys did a great job bringing us together. But you know what is really great is to come to church and to see each other to see you playing those drums, to see you worshiping God, to see you dancing, to hear your shout, to hear your amen, to see your smile in the foyer, walking down the, the hallway, and to hear a word of encouragement. You know what motivates us is togetherness. And then when we have a relationship, this past Friday night, I don't get to go to too many of these type of things, but they had a chili cook-off. Now, I'm not gonna participate on the donuts, but the chili cook-off, I'm all in. My, my struggle, my struggle was all of the different chilies that were available. I love them all. And it was kind of like asking me, which one of your children is your favorite? Well, I like this about, I like the spiciness of this one. I love the tomatoes of this one. I love the white beans in this one. I love this one. I love them all. I wanted to vote for them all. So I ate all of them. And then I went back and ate them all again. Are you with me? You did too, Carl. <laughs> and you paid for it later. My son had a stack of cups where he just finished one, set the next one, and he had a stack of cups that big. I think about what happens when we come together, church. There's something incredible that happens when we come together as a church family. And the reason we need help is because we are in a battle. And you can try to fight all by yourself. But man, fighting together, not fighting flesh and blood, but fighting the enemy together when you're in need, your future depends on it. It really does. So when we come together, we come together in corporate service like this, something great happens when we have a small group come together and that small group becomes people that you can do life with intimately and you pray together and you share needs together and you say, hey, you know, I'm really going through something that's kind of private, but I'm going through this. Pastor Eric, could you pray for me? And to know that he's going to pray and be there. And then a place, a safe place where you know they're on my side. Uh, 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 we can share our most intimate things we go through and know that you're loved, you're accepted. You're not going to be judged. You're going to be supported. You're going to be encouraged. We're going to pray for one another. We're going to say words of encouragement. And then what happens is when you go through something a little bit later, God will, because now we're in relationship and we have one another, God will drop a little something. You might not even know you're saying something, but you're saying something to someone and they get ministered to. All of a sudden, for them, for you, you just thought you were saying something sweet. And for them, they're going like, oh my goodness, the Lord spoke to me. That's why we need each other. You're not in this alone. But the most important thing you can do is call out for him.